Good morning, bon dia. My first words are for the graduates on a day that should rightly be dedicated to the recognition of your successes. Pompeu Fabra University, as well as the Universities of Barcelona and uh, Autonomous University of Barcelona, are extremely proud to have contributed to the development of all your talent, and indeed, all the international talent here in Barcelona. Second, I would like to excuse my fellow, my fellows, Professor Javier Lafuente, Rector of Universitat Autónoma de Barcelona, and Joan Guardia, Rector of Universitat de Barcelona, who were held up by previous meetings. On their behalf, I extend warm greetings and congratulations to you. Do I have to restart? <laughs> no, thank you. <clears throat> you, the classes of 2020 and 2021, have already become alumni of eBay, an energetic institution that in few years has established itself as a leading academic institution in terms of politics and international relations. From my point of view, this results from the successful combination of three elements. A critical mass, an international community, and outstanding research. This own model allows eBay to offer world-class graduate programs to prepare you for doctoral studies, as well as for top jobs in politics and international relations related professions. Today, eBay has become consolidated and has achieved a high level of recognition as an academic and research center, both at the European level and international level. The most recent one, it has been recognized as a CERCA, CERCA Center. CERCA is a network made up by outstanding research centers of Catalonia which I am sure will allow eBay to improve the visibility and impact of its research, maximize synergies, as well as consolidate its standards of excellence. Finally, I would like to address a few words to the parents, relatives, and friends that cannot be here, but that are following us online. Nobody but you are prepared to share and to enjoy this kind of celebrations the celebration of your sons and daughters' success in the highest level of education. And at the same time, nobody but you know the way in which our dear graduates are singular and specific in their selves. Thank you very much for choosing eBay, and congratulations, graduates, because from now on, many doors are opening for you, leading to a whole landscape of opportunities. Thank you very much. Uh, dear Rector of the Pompeu Fabra University, Dr. Oriol Amat, uh, many thanks for your nice uh, words. Dear, uh, dear professors and researchers of eBay, dear eBay graduates, uh, students and parents, friends, relatives, in the name of the Barcelona Institute of International Studies, or Institute Barcelona de Studies Internationals, from its Catalan acronym, as we call it uh, most of the time, I warmly welcome you to this graduation ceremony for the class of uh, 2020. Before introducing uh, Professor Isabel Angelowski, who is going to offer you the uh, 2020 graduation lecture, I would like you uh, to add a few words uh, regarding eBay and your progress during the course uh, uh, 2019-2020 uh, at the Institute. eBay class of uh, 2020 has been exceptional for a very basic reason, the COVID-19 pandemic. The entire eBay community has been committed to fight the need and we should express our solidarity with all of those who fell ill or who lost loved ones. When it started in March uh, 2020, few of us could have uh, forcing the dramatic consequences it has created and how strong it will impact on our life and professional activities, and in particular for the development of teaching activities in higher education institutions, as it is our case at eBay. 
Since then, we have been coping with the circumstances created by the pandemic as much as well and as well as we have been able. I mean to make your learning experience as a master's student at TVA exceptional, despite all unexpected difficulties. For this reason, I would like you to thank you uh, as a student, as well as the teaching and administrative staff at TVA, for your resilience and adaptability to the difficult situations we have been coping with during these COVID-19 times. You have been able, despite all difficulties, to gain a different view of the world and international affairs, not only by attending online during a significant part of the course, a wide variety of classes and workshops, reading papers and writing essays, but also by virtually sharing your personal experience with your fellow students from more than 50 different countries. Thus, I expect you now perceive the complexities and nuances of international politics and globalization in a way that will seriously support and fuel your professional careers in the years to come. Finally, I must confess that EVA needs your support, including your class. EVA alumni now is over 1,400 uh, graduates from more than 80 different countries, most of them actively working as professionals in many different fields of international affairs. Graduates are without doubt the most important capital of EVA, and we are committed to facilitate your connections and networking as well as providing information and collaboration to you in many different ways in the years to come. However, we also need you from now on to continue building a strong professional, personal and intellectual ties with you. We expect that you will help us to make EVA a stronger academic institution, to emerge as one of the major graduate schools in international studies in Europe, but also, and first of all, a place to come back from time to time here in Barcelona and a place to be proud of. Now, I will introduce you on our keynote speaker for the graduation lecture. It's my pleasure to introduce you, uh, Professor Isabel Angelowski. She is an ICREA uh, research professor trained in urban and environmental planning, currently working at the Institute of Environmental Science and Technology, ICTA, at the University, Autonomous University of Barcelona. Her research is situated at the intersection of urban planning and policy, social inequality, and development studies. She is the director of the Barcelona Lab for Urban Environmental Justice and Sustainability, a groundbreaking research laboratory carrying comparative and interdisciplinary research, developing new teaching methods and courses, and promoting learning on justice and inclusion for planning sustainable, green, and healthy cities. Most of her research is centered on studying processes and dynamics that led to more just, resilient, healthy, sustainable cities, bringing together theory from urban planning, public policy, urban and environmental sociology, also uh, urban geography. A key aspect of her research is to make it meaningful for and engage with local environmental justice activists and municipalities. And actually, before starting her PhD, uh, she held several positions in international development NGOs. Recent topics of uh, her research include environmental justice and the impact of COVID-19 in public spaces, or the role of ethics and justice in the struggle against climate change, exemplifying her concern for some of the major challenges our society societies are facing in this age of uncertainties and multiple transformations. We are very honored to, that she accepted our invitation to give this graduation lecture for this year at EVA for our students of the 20, uh, 2020 class. Professor Angelowski, this is a great honor to have you with us today. Just take my mask off because I'm far away enough, hopefully from you all. Uh, thank you so much, Jacin, for the invitation. Thank you to the Pompeu Fabra, which is one of the first universities in Barcelona that I ever heard of when I was uh, a little bit younger than you in the early 2000, when I was in France, in Sciences Po, 
doing my undergrad degree, and everyone was saying, you know, you've got to go to the Pompeii, which has the best political science department in Southern Europe. And now it's just like you have this institute, eBay, which is recognized Europe-wide and, uh, and, and worldwide as this incredible international, cross-national cross also, and cross-disciplinary research, teaching center. And I, don't, I hope that you realize the privilege that um, it is to be in such an institution because you have teachers from uh, all over the world. Those of you together also as students have an incredible wealth just from your worldwide experiences, Global North, Global South. And, and I think that's really quite unique from, from having studied in France and also in the US. Uh, you are in such an incredible place and also a city for that matter, like a great laboratory for the themes that you study. So I'm really happy to be here. I also feel that it means I'm getting older, that I'm getting invited to give a speech for graduation, but all right, I can take it. And um, I'll try to share some words of wisdom since I guess older age comes with that as well. Um, but at any rate, so I wanted to talk a bit today about uh, the defining questions of what I see are uh, our times, which is how will cities and urban environments respond to the combined crisis of climate change and COVID, how do we move also beyond the ecological, climate, and health crises that we are facing uh, in the global north and south, and the pandemic and climate change anxiety and fear that surrounds us. Just within two months this summer, what have we seen in relationship with those compounding, compounding impacts of climate change and the pandemic? Wildfires all over the American Northwest as well as on permafrost land in Siberia. Those second ones were not as reported, but they were the widest uh, fires in the world. We also saw damaging floods in Germany, in Sri Lanka, in Guatemala. We saw heat waves in the northern um, Western America as well. We saw hurricanes going through Boston. So basically a series of realizations that are we at a turning point? Is the world at a turning point between climate and the pandemic, and how do we react to this as individuals? How do you react to, to this and move beyond the fear and the paralysis that, um, that I think also um, permeate our life? Why do I talk about that? For example, in 2017, the American Psychological Association coined a new term, eco-anxiety, which is a chronic fear that we as citizens are seeming to experience in relationship to environmental issues. Then three years later, in 2020, the Yale Center for Climate Communication found that 69% of Americans are somewhat worried about climate change, while 30% are very worried, which is a jump of 8% in just two years. So we live, we constantly live through uh, those fears. Then Yale polls that same year reported that among the very worried, 85 are very afraid, 81 are very sad, and 61% feel helpless. And that's what I think is really a challenge of our time. Knowing what we see in the news, and we are constantly exposed to news via social media, via the newspaper, way more than when I was um, in your situation in the early 2000s. How do we move beyond this paralyzing fear? And my argument here is that each generation has its own form of crisis, its own form of the end of the world, is, is coming to us, and the question is, maybe it's the end of one type of world, one type of society, the way we live it, but hopefully it's also just a change also, just a radical change that is needed toward a different type of world, a different type of, of development, and a different type also of attitude. And the message that I'm trying to give myself every day, because I also experience that fear, is the importance of dissent of dissent, of resistance, of moving beyond thoughts that are you know, market as usual, business as usual, politics as usual, and trying different types of actions to, to move beyond this fear. And, and I often think, wow, but what were the other fears that people had that really were so widespread? And so I keep thinking here, and I share a bit of a personal story. I, real, I rarely talk about my, my older family, but my father was a professional soccer player he was born in 1934 and grew up under communism in Bulgaria. 
he, uh, he played for the national team of Bulgaria, and this at the same time as he was uh, forced to farming uh, different types of land, and he also saw his friends being tortured, and having to live through that type of fear of the, the very hard moments of uh, communism in Bulgaria. But because he was on the national soccer team, he was allowed to leave the country and then became an engineer towards the end of his soccer career in the, um, in the 1970s, worked in international uh, companies, building hospitals and other types of facilities as an engineer. But then another fear came, which is that he was living here in Northern Europe, um, in Reims, next to where I was born, in a place that he was told he was a KGB agent. So we constantly had people coming to our homes trying to see if my father was a KGB agent. And yes, he maintained a little bit that type of, um, let's say, fear among people around him because he was always dressed up with a long black coat and you know, big hat and looking at people in my tiny village like, he could be a bit of a threatening individual, but he was not a KGB agent. And what happened is that the French government back then, and many people from Eastern Europe experienced that. We don't realize this now, but it was just 35 years ago. He wasn't allowed to stay in France. He always had to ask for a permit to be able to stay, and so was everyone from Eastern Europe, um, a residency permit even if he was married and he had a daughter, who was me. And so he taught me in some ways that we need, through our own personal fear that he experienced, but also the other fears, to, to be able to move beyond that and descend. And interestingly enough, I descended from him, who also came from a very patriarchal country. He wanted me to be an engineer. And I became someone who is an urban planner. He thought engineering was giving me more security uh, as a profession than political science, which in some ways he was, he, he was true. But then, you know, he passed away and in a way that allowed me to descend in some, you know, very tragic ways. So anyway, I broke down a bit these patterns, these fears that were around my family. And then the trajectory that I decided to undertake was one that was very varied, very diverse. But then I would say um, back then that type of trajectory, which was to move between professions and between NGOs and between uh, organizations, was not really something that one would do. I think nowadays your generation is much more prepared to maybe work for two years in a municipal government, then go and work in an NGO. But back then, you might have just worked your whole career in one place. So as Justin was saying, um, I first studied political science in France. Uh, I studied political socialization of youth. I went to do my undergraduate thesis in Cuba, which was a crazy time because there was no exchange between Cuba and Europe back then. So I went as a, um, as a tourist, not as a student, and became very embedded um, and embodied in some way in student youth organizations and study how the Cuban regime was socializing and reproducing the revolution from generation to generation. And I came back, I did a master's in international development in Paris, uh, and there I was like maybe a few of you, which was I was the youngest of my cohort coming from a small village, and somehow I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. Like I'm doing international development, but I haven't practiced ever before. And something that masters like yours, very interdisciplinary people with many different backgrounds brought me is the tightness of the community, the relations, and the very long-standing relationships that, um, that get built in the cohort. And in the end, the support that one finds um, to different types of career moves that you might make. And so anyway, people of my cohort said, don't worry, Isabel, what you can do now is try to become embedded in a project during your, your master's. And so a friend of mine who also had not a lot of experience, we fundraised around 20, 30,000 euros, back then with a lot of money, to build a library in Nicaragua. So we went there just after Hurricane Mitch, there was a lot of need, the country was really devastated. And so we stayed there for a year, built that library around women, uh, with women, doing different workshops on women empowerment in the context of rural development. And that really felt like something concrete, something really powerful. And I came back to Boston, I'm sorry, then I came back to Europe, wanted to move to Barcelona because I was also working with a small NGO here called Sodepau. Sodepath does a lot of really great job in rural development. Uh, but then I thought, the world is also here to try to teach me other aspects of international development which could be broader, NGO, larger scale NGOs. And so 
I did an internship in Oxfam in the year 2001, was going to come back to Barcelona, and then life circumstances made that I met my husband and I stayed 10 years in Boston. Not three months, too much of my mother's devastation. So I stayed there for 10 years. And I also, my career in a way, or my interest evolved because working in Oxfam, I was first working on environmental contamination and indigenous rights, especially indigenous women's rights, impacted by oil and mining in Latin America. So by lots of oil spills, oil contamination, gas exploration that were damaging the livelihoods of indigenous groups, and working with Oxfam to build a gender empowerment policy. And in some ways, you may be like, wow, this is completely different from what she's doing now, like she does urban planning. But what I try to keep in my trajectory and how I built, maybe now it's, it's easy to make sense, and back then it was just trying to to find my way or to find uh, a way that would work for me was to have a thread. And the thread since then that has always motivated me is how do we address the environmental inequalities that are often very much combined with social inequalities that women, lower income residents and racialized minorities are facing. And so when I came back to Boston, um, I was hired by the Harvard School of Public Health to manage a program of grants for minority students who are studying public health and degraded environments. And so one of the activities that I had to organize was a toxic tour. And a toxic tour of a neighborhood that basically looked and was like Poblano here, so you know, 500 meter or a kilometer from the city center. And it had 1,600 vacant sites that were contaminated. So think about Poblano in the early 2000s with 1,600 contaminated sites, asbestos, dumping of rotten meat, appliances, 90% minority residents, African Americans, Latino living there. So the idea was that we were exposing students to the dark realities of environmental inequalities and environmental injustice. And so from then, I was there to support students develop their own research, right? What is the health impact of being exposed to such environment, of not being in a good home, in a safe place to be. And then from there, I felt like, well, these students are all doing research. Maybe I could go back to research, which is what I thought I could do a little bit better than other things like advocacy or fundraising. So I started my PhD at MIT, and that's closer now to our uh, time period, at least in my mind. And I really entirely shifted to urban issues. And so what I look at now is the inequalities again, that people in urban environments are facing in relationship to different aspects. Climate change, pandemics, and other, uh, let's say, global health crises, but also access to good transportation, access to homes, access to, um, to, to food, for example, and other types of amenities. But also came a breaking point, and I don't know when, the breaking point will happen to you, maybe it has happened already, but when I was about to publish my, my book, my first and almost only book up to uh, November this year, which is called Neighborhood as Refuge, it's a comparison of neighborhood activism for environmental justice in Barcelona, in Havana, and Boston. I, did, I was doing two interviews, and it was literally just before the book was published, and it was with two activists in Boston. One of them who was like, we were in a coffee shop and he was like, look at all of these land, Isabel, that we cleaned up. We had 1,600 empty and contaminated lots by the end of the 1990s. Now we have like 700 only. So really converted a lot of these lots into farms, gardens, affordable housings, parks, playgrounds. Imagine what would happen if all of a sudden we were all kicked out because of land speculation, of real estate, development projects that would completely gentrify our neighborhood. Do you think we should really continue doing this type of work? Because at the end of the day, the environmental improvements will come for others. And the do you think was not for me to give a um, you know, professional opinion. It was more like, wow, what are we doing as environmental activists? And that was the first time that I really came across this paradox, this conundrum of who are we building green and healthy uh, cities for? And that was something that he and his NGOs were really, you know, really grappling with. It was a key challenge for their work. 
And then a few days later, I was doing another interview in an amazing project. It was a tennis club, a municipal tennis club that had been converted into a tennis club for minority students. And you know, tennis is a very white sport in general, and had community gardens for after-school activities that were meant to be for those minority students as well. So combining sports and um, uh, physical activity and environmental uh, work. And the leader of the project was saying, you know what, Isabel, I'm just so sick of moving. It's the third time that I move through Boston in four years. And every time I move, it's because I've been doing um, community gardening work. I created this urban farm. Everyone is super happy. And then all of a sudden, there's a developer who comes in and be like, isn't it a great area to redevelop and transform into uh, a newly developed condos for the very rich? And so his point was every time they were doing something to embellish and improve his neighborhood, there was a uh, developer coming up, either converting an old house or building on an empty lot, a very high income housing that were not benefiting the residents that were actually working on those gardens. And at the same time, those gardens were being advertised as community activities by the, by the developer. So that person was like, every time I have to move because the price around just gets higher and higher. And now it's the third time that I move and basically I'm told by my neighbor, do not dare to start a community garden here. And so I'm facing the real challenge of my life, which is I love to garden and this is a very important activity for community cohesion, for access to food among minority residents. I mean, obesity is not a personal choice, especially not in the United States. It's a structural poverty reflection. And so he was saying, either I'm facing with, okay, I built a garden, I improve my neighborhood, I create new social ties, or not only would I be uh, likely to be displaced to the next neighborhood, I could actually be kicked out of Boston 15, 20 miles away because the entire area is being so overinflated in terms of real estate prices that actually I won't be able to afford staying here. And because land use and transit planning in the US is so backwards and is so, um, how can I say it in a polite way, is so undervalued, this resident was like, I'm a service worker, I get paid, um, and I do not have a health insurance that's decent enough if I get sick. I don't have sick leave. So if I miss my work because the transit system is so poor that I cannot access my job every day, then living 15 miles away from Boston might kill me. And when he told me that, I was like, oh my God, what am I studying? Environmental justice improvements and how people improve their neighborhood when actually everyone is telling me we need to stop doing that because the only way that people are able to stay living in cities are if they don't improve their neighborhood or if they do it in a way that is so discreet and so, um, so minimal that it's not being taken advantage of. So basically, after publishing the book, it was great. I was like, okay, I need to change what I'm doing. And so in a way, what I'm studying now and that's been for the past eight to nine years is environmental gentrification that Justine was uh, describing earlier. And I look at environmental gentrification that is the way in which the environment and environmental improvements become embedded in inequality creation, in displacement. I do it through three ways. I look at food, so the, the transformation of food environments, new markets, new organic stores, new cafes, new farms, community gardens. I give you the example of the Mercat de San Antoni, who is now benefiting from the Mercat de San Antoni in Barcelona. It was a wonderful project and I'm glad it was done, but the gentrification that has occurred around it has really made the neighborhood tremendously expensive. I also look at this in the context of green space gentrification, meaning all of the conversion of um, old waterfronts, vacant lots into green spaces and the way in which they are embedded in new forms of displacement. And then I also look at it from the context of climate change, meaning how cities that are now facing the climate emergency, responding to the climate emergency and using green infrastructure to create, um, to alleviate the impact of climate change, how that's also embedded with displacement, with the creation of refuge for the very wet, rich, and the wealthy rather than being spaces for, for everyone. And so just to move towards the, the latter part of the, of the talk, talking a bit more about uh, intellectual things than uh, personal stories, is that I see that, or we see in our research lab that there are three domains that are really deeply impacted by this compounding climate crisis and um, health crisis, and that those are creating cumulative 
environmental and social vulnerabilities. It's housing, it's transit, and it's green and public space. You could name many others. I could talk a lot about uh, jobs and poverty creation, but let's say I'm focusing, as an urban planner, I'm focusing on the structure of cities. So housing, uh, transit or transportation, and green space. Um, so with both COVID and climate change, what do we see? That living in crowded conditions, in very dense housing and very poorly insulated and also poorly ventilated spaces at the same time, increases the risk of infection and increases the risk of flooding or heating, uh, heat island effects. If you take uh, the COVID crisis, for example, the 70% 70, um, 70 of the districts in the UK, in the United Kingdom, that had the most overcrowded home conditions were those where the COVID rate expanded the fastest. In India, for example, another place with 65%, 65 million people living in informal settlement, the reproduction rate of COVID is 1.2 to 1.4 times greater than it is in formal settlements. And so, of course, here, being poor, being exposed to poor crowded conditions, both in the north and south, increases your chance of infection. If we also look at essential workers, essential workers was not a word that really we used before COVID that much, but actually many people around our cities that make our cities work in transportation, in the uh, health sector, in stores, in the food industries, all of those are health, are essential workers, and most of them are working class to lower middle class residents. Those do not have the luxury that I have, that maybe in a way, uh, many people in my uh, educational world, except if you are um, a K-12 to teacher, primary school or secondary school teacher, can isolate or uh, work from home. And so those have been, been more exposed to the COVID infection at the same time have not had, had good conditions or the ability to stay, um, to stay put. And all of this in real estate markets in global cities that have completely blown up, especially just in the years before uh, the COVID crisis. Cities are deeply unequal and housing and housing access is one of the greatest crises that reflects poverty, but at the same time increases the poverty of residents because of the debt and the mortgages that people have um, to take. So what have some cities done in relationship to increasing housing uh, safety. Some have declared a housing moratorium, that's a form of temporary solutions. Others have decommodified housing to a greater extent, like in Vienna, for example, where so, so, so much more housing is public or social in comparison with a place like Spain, for example, with only 3% of all housing is social or public. Some countries like Spain or the Netherlands have a minimum guaranteed income and others are trying to reverse, but slowly, 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 decade-long cuts in public housing funding. So you really need a, um, a toolkit, really, of anti-poverty and pro-housing rights policies to address both COVID and climate change, because otherwise you have these compounding uh, vulnerabilities. And then you have added issues, which are like cities like Barcelona, for example, or Venice or Lisbon, that have so much tourism-induced gentrification and um, real estate development that you also need a form of regulation, which is that Barcelona is doing and Lisbon as well, to try to regulate a bit the short-term rental industry, which is at the same time as it is taking long-term rentals out of the market, creating really difficult access to housing for residents. Second domain, public transit. We are very lucky in a place like Barcelona and in many cities of Europe to have quite well-developed public transit systems. But if we think about it, they are very successful at the city scale level, but much less so at the metropolitan and the regional level, where in a place like Barcelona, for example, 700,000 cars every day commuting inside, um, inside the city. And so with climate change, we go back to the same uh, problem as we do with uh, the pandemic. If you are a professional worker, you have been able to work from home, or you are able to resort to the private car if you are afraid of taking public transit, which are one of the places where people have been most afraid of going with the pandemic. But if you are an essential worker, if you are, um, especially so actually for women workers, I'm feminizing my talk here a little bit, you have no other option than using public transit. 
So in that case, what you need now for cities is an increasing funding guaranteed for expanding the number of cars, of lines, also of making multimodal transit possible, like combining tram, bus, uh, train, but also regional trains, and addressing some of the deficit issues that those agencies have had. For example, in Boston, just before COVID, the MBTA, which is the, um, the regional agency, was 30 million euros in deficit. It couldn't even fix cars that were broken. So this is, again, going back to the first country in the world, the level of modernization, but also sustainability planning that's needed to get us out of this combined crisis of, trans of uh, climate change and the pandemic. And some would say, well, it's also great because many cities have resorted to expanding the bike networks and bike infrastructure. That's great in many ways, like Milan added uh, 50 kilometers of bike lanes, Paris almost the same, Barcelona is fantastic for biking. But we go back to the same issues of inequality. If you are um, like us, you know, maybe students who, are, who live on campus or me who is able to live close to my, to my work, I can commute one or five kilometers by bike. But many essential workers, because of the structure of the real estate market, live oftentimes at the periphery of cities so being on a nice foldable bike or an electric scooter is not an option for them. And so we have to also think about sustainable mobility from the point of view of these intersectional needs and vulnerabilities that uh, people on the lower end of the, of the social spectrum are facing. And then finally, public space. We are seeing a lot of, let's say, controversial talks among urbanists about what is best to do with public space to be able to take streets away from cars. If we think about it, 70% of all our streets are dedicated to cars. So we need to create new forms of green space. And many cities are doing it well by expanding networks of small and large green and blue spaces. Valencia, Nantes, Copenhagen, Amsterdam are very strong examples of this. Barcelona uh, as well, to much extent. But here we come back to what I was uh, sharing a bit earlier, the risk of also gentrification that comes back to us when we uh, try to expand greening in, uh, in cities. And so how can we make green space that are inclusive, accessible, and then also affordable over the long term without making them engines of uh, gentrification? So I'm just concluding here. We need to shift overall urban planning priorities, considering also the challenges of security, and war and safety that our cities are also facing with climate change, the number of climate refugees is also going up. And so how do we deal with those issues in an intersectional way? I would say that the role of research here is important. I have to defend my profession somehow uh, a little bit. And I think that what we must highlight as the researchers is that the political and economic drivers be behind climate change and behind the negative impacts of the pandemic on people are still the same and are remaining the same as before. Speculative land use and housing practices, concentration of capital in the hands of elite, extreme housing commodification versus housing as a social good and a human right, structural racism and social spatial uh, segregation. I think that also we are here as researchers to provide an intersectional, meaning a combined, um, a multifaceted analysis from a justice standpoint of all of the policies that are being put in place to address climate change and to address um, the challenge of the pandemic. We have an important responsibility to illuminate the multiple vulnerabilities and risks that different types of residents are facing, considering the compounding impacts uh, of those two crises. And then finally, our role can also be sometimes more than denunciating. It is also about uncovering, trying to support and scale up positive progressive practices at the level of cities, municipalities, like political agents, but residents as well, citizens like you and me and uh, nonprofits. Something that we do a lot also as researchers, in addition to giving bit too long speeches is right. And I think that's something I want to encourage you to do, is using the power of the world, wherever you are, uh, from a think tank, from an NGO, from a municipal 
planner that you might be, to write. Write in many different ways, write in many different um, spectrums and outlets, because that power of storytelling, which is a bit what I was trying to do, can also be uh, inspiring, even if it's, of course, uh, not enough uh, at all. And there are some fantastic tools that we use in research, some are called story maps, and they use a combination of spatial analysis and um, images and videos. Other tools are called interactive web documentaries, which is fantastic because it's combining small pieces of videos with mapping, with pictures, with archival work. And so the power of communication in that sense can also be very revealing in, um, of the struggles of uh, our time. So anyway, what I'm hoping here to conclude with is not to be completely pessimistic, try to overcome our fear, our eco, our health, anxiety, and, um, and dissent, and trying to be that, doing that in a very loud voice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jean Grosky, for your stimulating, very stimulating speech. Uh, I think it's a lot of food for thought. And uh, now we are going to proceed with the speakers to address the, the students, uh, starting with uh, Professor uh, Frank Borgevitska from uh, eBay faculty. Dear graduates, parents, friends, partners, and family, dear colleagues, dear faculty, that microphone needs to be adjusted. Better? Okay. <laughs> First of all, thank you all for coming here today. I recognize that this was very hard uh, under the circumstances, and I think it's tremendous that so many of you made the way to, back to Barcelona because it gives us the opportunity to reconnect, and that, I think, is a very important way also to get closure on this academic year, 2019-20. Um, that ended with a bit of a disruption when we all had to go into lockdown. And a special welcome also to those who are following online. I guess I'm looking at you now. Um, so a special welcome to you as well. And we are thinking about you here today uh, while we're here together, but we are thinking of you as well. So when I was approached with the question whether I would be willing to give a speech during this, this ceremony, um, my first reaction was obviously delight, and then followed immediately by a profound sense of dread. So what was I supposed to say after almost 18 months of intermittent COVID lockdowns? Right? I may know a lot about Zoom etiquette by now, or virtual etiquette in general, but all my real life memories seem to have become a bit hazy. So what did I do? As any good academic, I started out with a review of what's already out there. What is the state of the art in the world of graduation speeches? <laughs> Find the giants and stand on their shoulders. Fortunately, the best graduation speeches are on YouTube. So researching this was really easy. It didn't really take me out of my digital comfort zone. And I guess in many ways, it probably also resembled your experience of the eBay online seminars that you attended en masse after we all had to desert the classroom. So what did I find? The first to draw my attention was obviously Alice Cooper. Did that joke work? Alice Cooper, the grandfather of heavy metal? Okay. So, I had to watch this. This was the most important video I had to watch first. Um, so, what did he have to say? I only want to quote the most essential parts of his speech here. Whatever you do, avoid mediocrity. Mediocrity is your enemy. Okay, that was nice and aspirational, but it did not really fit. I don't usually wear makeup or show up to work bare-chested. And I actually even got a haircut for this speech. Some of you know that it's a special thing for me. Um, and Alice Cooper certainly didn't do so for his. And if you watch the video, you will see that. And let's be honest, when you walked into eBay classes towards the end of the first term, and everybody was exhausted from the many assignments, the exams, the essays, you may have seen some signs of mediocrity around you sometimes. <laughs> The next big hitter was J.K. Rawlings, the author of the Harry Potter novels. Her speech has become famous for the description of Rawlings' experiences of poverty and failure, and how this has helped her strip away all the inessential things, and to focus only on what was truly important to her, which was writing and telling stories, 
and which made her rich and very famous, of course. Now, doing what you really care about and what you're really good at is certainly something that I would recommend to you, but I also do not want to wish you failure. If you can go down directly the Alice Cooper Road and avoid mediocrity or worse, then I'd be even happier for you. And you should expect to be invited to give one of those eBay graduation speeches very soon, if that happens to you. But there are other, less widely noted parts of her speech that resonated. These had to do with the power of empathy, imagination, and the use of the skills and career opportunities that a university degree affords to improve the life of those less fortunate. I quote, if you choose to use your status and influence to raise your voice on behalf of those who have no voice, if you choose to identify not only with the powerful, but with the powerless, if you retain the ability to imagine yourselves into the lives of those who do not have your advantages, then it will not only be your proud families who celebrate your existence, but thousands and millions of people whose reality you have helped change. I realize, of course, that not all of you will be fortunate enough to change the lives of millions, let alone thousands of people. But it is good to remind ourselves that in this day and age, a graduate degree like that of eBay still tends to confer status. And that status should confer some responsibility to be of help to those less advantaged. The third speaker that I looked at came to this theme of education from a slightly different angle. I'm talking, of course, about the famous Stanford graduation address by Steve Jobs. I paraphrase from a script here because it is his broader story that matters, not specific quotes. An adopted child, Steve's non-college educated working class parents spent all their life savings to honor the wish of his biological mother that he should receive university education. But after six months in college, Steve couldn't see the value in this. In his own words, I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life and no idea how college was going to help me find it out. And here I was, spending all of the money my parents had saved their entire life. So I decided to drop out and trust that it would all work out okay. Which it obviously did. Although Steve suffered terrible health problems later in his life, dropping out of college certainly did not harm his professional prospects. To go with Alice Cooper, there was little mediocrity in his life. Now I have to admit that I'm not a Macintosh man myself, in fact, I sometimes felt uneasy by the degree of idolization received by a man who was a wonderful designer and a technical visionary, but who could be a pretty hard-nosed businessman as well, and whose company often seems to place its extraordinarily high profit margins above even the most basic responsibilities that it owes to the societies in which it operates. But I think there is something in Steve Jobs' story that I think resonates with the state of the world that provided the background for when you decided to come to eBay and during the time that you spent here in Barcelona. I know from our discussions in class and beyond that many of you were struck by how strongly societies over those past years seem to have become divided along the lines of education. In important places like the US, the UK, and many other parts of the world, voting and political opinions now seem to differ visibly between those who have some form of higher education and those who do not. For those of us comfortable in our high-skilled cosmopolitan bubbles like eBay, it is also painful to see how science and learned opinions are increasingly rejected by important parts of the media, politics, and society. Now, I personally get a bit itchy when it is suggested that to overcome these problems, we should simply provide more university education for everyone. In terms of practical feasibility, that still seems to be a long way off. And it may simply engender another red race for even higher levels of qualification. So perhaps what the example of Steve Jobs shows, and that of many other people who did not, who did not go on to build uh, multi-billion dollar empires, is that there are other equally fulfilling ways out there to lead a good life. But I think that the tumultuous social and political events, especially of the past 18 months of the pandemic, did teach us something about the value and essence of education that I would like you to take away from your time here at eBay. And I don't mean to belabor the old liberal arts cliche here that a degree from a social science institute like ours is not primarily meant to fill you up with specific pieces of knowledge, but to teach you how to think. But still, what we have learned over the past 18 months is that things that we thought we knew were, that we thought we knew were often highly uncertain. And that in extreme circumstances, knowledge, especially of the scientific kind, 
can become outdated very, very quickly. Just like your master's dissertations and much of the academic research of myself and my colleagues here at eBay, scientific discovery can go into countless dead ends and rabbit holes before a clear picture or story emerges. For us academics, that convoluted process of knowledge production is part of our daily bread and butter. And it actually enables us to go to all those nice conferences and workshops that we used to attend before the pandemic. So it also has some benefits for people like us. But sadly, what we have learned during the last year and a half is that in some circumstances, the speed of discovery and the way we make use of the new information generated can be a matter of life and death. To me, the most striking experience during those first months of the pandemic was really how little we knew about this disease, which comes from a family of well-studied viruses after all, nor what to do about it. This involved medical questions well outside the comfort zone of social science graduates like ourselves, such as the benefits of mask wearing, which I'm not doing right now, um, or the, the effectiveness and possible side effects of different vaccines. On these matters, the scientific consensus could change on an almost daily basis and with every new study published. But also in the area of public policy, which is closer to your and my ballpark, the degree of uncertainty could be tremendous. How difficult it seemed to navigate the way between these alternative policy options available and the multiple trade-offs and really heavy social impacts they involved. And I must say that looking back with some degree of hindsight, I still struggle to see, within a reasonable range of comparisons, which country or region really did better, because things fluctuated so much, and the specific drivers and long-term consequences of different policies are still so uncertain or hard to attribute in, with any degree of analytical rigor. Now, with climate change increasingly showing its teeth and other problems like social injustices, weak global governance, and state failure still unresolved, we should be realistic enough to assume that your generation will most likely be exposed to other extreme situations of this kind. And I wish sincerely that in these circumstances, some of the skills that you acquired here at eBay will be of help as you go on to forge your own path in your personal and professional lives. To me, the liberal arts cliche of learning how to think in these contexts of uncertainty really means to be sufficiently humble about the things that we believe we know and to remain aware of the far greater range of things that we probably do not and cannot even yet know. Here, I want to bring in the last speaker that I came across. It is the novelist David Foster Wallace. He said that learning how to think really means learning how to exercise some control over how and what you think. Building on this quote, I want you to be careful and thoughtful in how you take on new knowledge and ideas to continue to learn to distinguish between good and bad information, and to remain sufficiently open-minded to revise your opinions and strategies when you see good and well-founded reasons to do so. Because if you don't, you will not only be totally host by potentially unimportant information, which is another quote from Wallace, but also too inflexible to respond to the pace at which new mega events appear to be coming our way. Now, all of this suggests a lot of humbleness and moderation and caution, but having gotten to know many of you for a year or longer, I know that you have the minds, the commitment, and the energy to truly make a difference. And so in closing, I want to throw our wise old friend Alice Cooper back into the mix. Be humble and realistic about what you know and what you don't know, but also avoid mediocrity whenever you can. Welcome to the growing community of eBay alumni that is already out there waiting to connect with you. Do stay in touch and all the very best for your future endeavors. Thank you. Many thanks, uh, Borges. It's a very wonderful talk. And we have uh, now uh, the next uh, student of the Masters of International and International Relations, Sierra Maya Malavanen. Okay, it's not Asian friendly. Hold on. <laughs> Buenas tardes a toda la comunidad de eBay 
exalumnos, amigos, facultad, profesores, familia, ya sea que están aquí o se interesando en, en todo el mundo, bienvenidos. The past two years felt like a blur. It felt so surreal that it's already been two years since we attended the welcome day at eBay, had our orientation with Professor Kisak, went through the shopping week to choose our courses, and started our first and only in-person semester. It went by so quickly from checking the attached map of the campus to scrubbling to book a flight back home because COVID-19 is starting to spread in Europe. We abruptly switched from having face-to-face -face classes to remote learning, which took away the little things that make school so fun, like meeting our friends before a class outside the eBay building, doing readings and cramming papers in the student room, studying at UPF's magnificent library, eating lunches and at the cafeteria or at Mensana, running to class and attending student parties, dinners, or drinking vermouth in the afternoon. It's very nice to reminisce, but it is necessary to look forward to what lies ahead of us. As C.S. Lewis said, there are far better things ahead than any we leave behind. Therefore, today, what I'd like to do is to celebrate us, each and every student. I want to celebrate you. You, who pursued to get your master's degree with honor and excellence while the world is falling around us. You, who persevered even after receiving countless job and internship rejection emails. You, who looked after your friends and colleagues despite the situation being tough even for yourself. You, who remained kind and sympathized with others during the hard times. You, who kept it together even after losing your loved ones. And you, who adapted to the changes and triumphs during the past two years. I'd also like to take this opportunity to celebrate our amazing professors in eBay for their continued support, both inside and outside the classroom. Thank you. You adopted your curricula to new teaching platforms and tools in a short amount of time, ensuring our access to quality education. You've reinvented what learning means and what learning looks like. Thank you to all our eBay staff for sticking by us throughout this tumultuous year. We appreciate your effort in creating an environment of safety and regularity conducive to learning. And last, but certainly not the least, thank you to our parents who encourage us every step of the way we are here today because of your sacrifices, effort, and guidance. Your contribution to our success does not go unnoticed. Although most of us did not envision our master's journey being caught by the pandemic, I believe that this experience has taught us more valuable lessons. First, to be gentle and kind to ourselves. Second, to pursue even harder the things that we love. Third, to prioritize what is truly important, health, family, relationships, and finally, to ground ourselves to the values that last. Some of us are still confused about the next steps. Some are still living in uncertainty. And most of us may not have the answers to many questions yet. But remember, we're no ordinary class. We face more challenges in getting our degree than the ones before us. For that reason, it makes me more confident to say that we will keep on conquering with grace the challenges that come our way and that there's no barrier that could stop us from becoming what we want to be. Muchas gracias, merci, thank you, maraming salamat, and congratulations to the class of 2020. Alberti, a student of the Masters uh, in International Security.
Bon dia a tothom. Benvolgut professorat, personal, estimats companys i companyes, estimats pares i mares que ens han reunit aquí. Per fi ho hem aconseguit. Voldria començar aquest discurs felicitant-vos a totes i a tots. Enhorabona. Congrats. Per tots els d'aquí que no parlin o entenguin el català, m'agradaria continuar, m'agradaria d'estar amb els meus companys i companyes en anglès. Kind friends and companions, I am honored to be your spokesman this morning. Alongside our dear colleague Ziarla, whichever diploma you're getting today, international relations, security, development, it's not every day that you conquer a master's degree diploma. So mark my words when I say that you should feel damn proud about yourselves. Some of our politicians here in Spain seem to pull up their master's diploma out of their sleeves with no effort whatsoever, but that's not us. We have worked hard for this, and we deserve to be here today. So be proud. We have shed blood, sweat, and tears to get this diploma. We have all worked overnight, and we have catched up the, um, you know, deadlines in the last moment. We have performed, or still performing, for those of us who are still working on our uh, final thesis. Uh, we have carried through this master admirably because it has been hard. It was particularly hard these last couple of years because some virus decided to show and mess our lives up. Some little flu or gripezinha, like Bolsonaro like to call it. We have had the immense pleasure of being the first beta testers or guinea pigs, if you will, of online teaching and working. During the second semester, we were freed from the tedious task of getting up early to commute to class. We were freed from the effort of gathering with some friends to work on a project and getting some drinks afterwards in celebration. Why do all that when you can educate yourself from the comfort of your home, <laughs> in, your, un in your, your underpants, able to turn off the camera anytime you want? <laughs> to turn off the camera to get some coffee or indulge yourself in some other pleasure while the professor keeps talking without a veil to the computer screen. Well, ain't that fine. Well, I don't know about you, fellas, but I'd rather not go through this experience ever again. <laughs> Whatever happened to seeing our newly made friends in class or at the cafeteria? Whatever happened to traveling to another country to experience the customs and the culture by, on your own as part of the education experience? Whatever happened to spontaneous debates and discussions at class where we could look into each other's eyes instead of the blinding light of a computer screen? It seems that we might be coming back from this after all, that, you know, face-to-face -face education will be saved, but who knows? In the future, maybe they'll perfect online teaching models. We'll have a hologram professor or who knows? But all I know is that we cannot afford to lose our studenthood. What is studenthood? What does it mean to be a student? Being a student means to prostrate oneself in front of humankind's immense sea of knowledge and choosing one of its streams, specializing in it, mastering it. Being a student involves this childlike curiosity, this craving to know how the world works just for the hell of it, not to get some grade or to get a job, being a student is much more than repeatedly facing exams and meeting deadlines to attain a certain grade. Education as a whole should move beyond that. We have been facing exams and deadlines for so long, and then we hit the wall of the professional world. And it hits so different, it, it, it is so different from the student world. When you keep sending motivational letters and emails, hoping, praying for a positive reply, we jump into every job offer like hungry hounds in front of a fresh piece of meat. We keep boasting our profiles, increasing our reputation on LinkedIn, to reach for anything they can throw at us, whether it be a precious entry-level job and rare, or a slave labor, I mean unpaid internship. <laughs> Those of you who already started looking for work have probably found out that it is more often than not a vocation of agony. But we must move on beyond that. Let these words be a reminder that when we walk out of here, diploma in hand, we will remain as students. 
We are never going to stop being students. And I'm not just talking about those of you who want to continue in your academic pursuits, getting a PhD. I'm talking about this lifelong experience of learning, the non-conformity, the refusal to settle down with the wisdom you've acquired during these two, two years. One can never be wise enough, not even when you're president of the Security Council. This is not the end of the road, fellow graduates. It is just the end of a short-lived episode of our lives and the beginning of a new one. But the question remains, what the hell will I do now? <laughs> what do I do? Where shall we steer this ship in this sea of uncertainty? Well, we can do much about the wind, but we can adjust the sails and we can reach a safe harbor. I really love ships. <laughs> Uh, for those of you whose idealism has not changed since you entered here and you're still living in this world of utopic dreams and you want to see, you want to use this wisdom to change the world, to have an impact and you ultimately reach positions of power so you can steer a bigger ship, that's the last one, of pol geopolitical interests, like the professor said, you gotta speak up, you gotta write, speak up for those who can for the voiceless, for the weak. Speak up for that which you hold dearest, whether it be your moral compass or your people, but most of all, speak up for yourselves. Don't let this professional world of work crush on your shoulders. You are valued. You have value in this world. Don't let them tell you that you ain't worth nothing. Do not allow, sorry. And if you got willing, you end up attaining any sort of position of power, if you end up influencing the ups and downs of international politics, use that power wisely. Don't fear change. Embrace it. We are change. We ourselves are the change. If there is something that we should fear, like the professor said, I'm convinced it is stagnation, business as usual, reactionarism, the stupor of male dominance and racism. I'm convinced that we are all above that. We are power. As the great Mahatma Gandhi said, we gotta be the change that we ought to see in the world. If you get there, if you attain these influential positions and you can steer the lives of millions of people, remember why you wanted to do this. Remember why you wanted to get there in the first place. Do not lose sight of your purpose. Someone said, the students of today are the leaders of tomorrow. Well, I believe you already are both of them things. And you always will be both of these things. And you absolutely rock at it. With that said, though we may go our separate ways, I hope our paths will cross again someday. Thank you, congratulations, good luck, and Godspeed. Thanks to Ciarla and Paul for the speech. And let's go start now with the conferment of uh, degrees. Just one minute, we're going to rearrange. Uh, and uh, Mariona and Robert are going to, to call you, the graduates, uh, for the uh, reception of the certificate. Let's just start, yeah. Okay, everyone, so welcome. This is where we have to do a certain choreography. So what we would like to do, we have all of you in the room, uh, 25 people online. I can actually see some empty seats here. So if you would be able to stand up in the first row and then come and stand to this corner here. So Gerao, if you would like to begin. If we line up, I will begin by reading every student's name and then uh, we will proceed up the stairs across the platform, receive the graduates. So if we could all get this going, this would be fantastic. So we're going to begin with the Masters of International Relations. So the first person we have is Gerald Carrera. <laughs> 
Can we have next Martina Cantonero? Right, we have one. Fadi's not here, right? Fadi? Fadi, come forward, please. Fadi Fada. <laughs> Timothy Hodson. <laughs> Caleb Johnson. Nathan Kim. Isabel Lengeling. Right, next we have So you, if you would just be able to receive the paper, because there can be no hand touching between, so no, no efforts to, to shake hands, please. Just receive the paper and then we pass on. Uh, so next up we have Zialame uh, Malabana. Adam. Next up we have Adam Mazrani. Valentina Obando. Eyes, it's got a picture. Excellent. So we've got the routine now. If you'd like to pass across. So next up we have Isaac Olmedo. Leah Rausch. Luisa Ribéry. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Mireya Sara. <laughs> Johanna Sota. Michael Spath. Thank you very much. Next three. So, next on my list, we have Oksana Stanovicana. Mariana Tostes. Manon Vejega. Thank you very much. Okay, Anthony Verden. Ekaterina Zepnova. Christian Trena. And now from the part-time, so the 1820 cohort, we have, first of all, uh, Pera Gernal, Gerald, <laughs> Paula Enau, <laughs> Michaela Horakova, And if we may just permit a four together in one photo, if Quintin, Quintin per, um, Picard Giran as well, the four. So now, technology permitting, we're going to go to the online. If you guys could just wait there a second. These are the remaining students of the Masters of International Relations who are not here. So we have going through first Mariana 
a Vila. Carla Boitel. Online. Uh, Susanna Noodlesman. Anna Clara Pitak. And Lin, uh, Lin Jan Jan Tao. No, Daniel, there we go. Oh, sorry. Yes, I've forgotten. I've gone down. Daniel Alzono, uh, uh, Adorno Cruz. And Lin Jan Jan Tao. Couldn't possibly be an online ceremony without a few mistakes from my side. Okay, so now we're moving on to the Masters of Public Policy. Uh, none of these four students uh, are here, but again, they're online, so welcome and thank you for joining. So first of all, we have uh, Denise uh, De Giorgio. Oh, we skipped Denise very quickly. Next up, we have Sarah Khan, who is here. Next up, Natalie Paredes um, Brenthinel. And finally, Patricia Valerio. Patricia. So, we now move on to the Masters of International Security. And first on my list, and my eyesight is very poor, Sylvan Edgeliman. Sylvan. Paul Alberti. And Diana Cortez. There we go. Lovely photo. If you could pass down from the stage, please. Next up, Maria Gomilia Marquez. Victoria Luconi. And Rebecca Vero. And again, if I could permit Lucas Wick as well, and we'll take a four. Yep, come on in. We've really got this going like clockwork, haven't we? So before we move on to the next master's program, we're going to go back online. We have four more students who are connecting remotely. The first of those is Julia uh, uh, Aguila. The next is Nate Hendrickser. Marty, uh, sorry, sorry, Marty Perra. And finally, Emily Remal. So we'll now move on to the Masters of International Development. And I would like to call up first, please, Emma Casey. Viveka Danielson. Valentina Gonzalez Arnau. <laughs> Sabrina Itzo. <laughs> Javier Marion. And Andrea Mora. Thank you very much. <laughs> 
So we will continue with Matthias uh, Simoes. And Catherine Osales. Absolutely lovely. Now then, the remaining students from the Masters of Development will be online with us. So let's read through them and give them a nice round of applause. The first one we have is um, Alison Arias. Juan Bonaguro. Jorge Hueso. Maquilla Cortes. Oriana Fuentes. Joe Mainero. Mainero. Ivelo Manchev. Cecilia Pena. Georgina uh, Rangel. Right, I'm kind of curious what the next name is going to be because I don't think they belong here. I have here Jordan Rico, but he was in IR, I thought. Oh, well. Jordan, I don't know what happened. And Isabel Sanchez, finally. Right. With that, again, I would like to congratulate everyone who's received their degrees, everyone online who has uh, also, of course, uh, done very, very well to get through to the end of the degree. Um, and I will pass the floor back to Professor Jordana for the remainder of the ceremony. Just, just to, to, conclude, uh, to conclude this ceremony, uh, the president of EVA, uh, Professor Nasti Serra, is going to address the uh, final words to the audience. Well. Good morning to the parents, the students, the faculty, the administration personnel, so efficient in our institute. Uh, someone has to conclude the ceremony. And uh, I think that to conclude the ceremony with another speech may be considered too much for you. <laughs> so le, 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 allow me to make just two points. One, our aim, our aim is not only increase your academic knowledge in international relations, but enlarging your vision of the world problems, helping you to have your own approach to address the problems of our world. Let me quote uh, a person who wrote uh, about 200 years ago, Clausewitz. Clausewitz had an approach to the formation in military matters that was very revolutionary at that moment. He said, he wrote, strategy, strategy is meant to educate the mind of the future commander or more accurately to guide him in his self-education. So, I hope that the course of debate has helped you, uh, has been fruitful in the process of your own plans of personal education. And don't forget that not only the academic knowledge is important to increase your expertise in international relations, 
you have to include as well uh, linguistic skills, to have historical sensitivity, to have an instinctive curiosity for the culture of the others, the other cultures, their values, their principles, how to build up bridges, how to make or help the necessary dialogue in the international field in our present world. We, second point, we are living in a globalized world. That's undeniable. But what's under discussion is whether the balance of costs and advantages is the same for everybody. And what we are knowing and seeing now is that uh, uh, is that the the problem the, the phenomenon of globalization has very different uh, different uh, opportunities, very different consequences according to the uh, people, the marginality, the countries, and so on. Globalization has increased the inequality in every country. So uh, every country, a democracy, for instance, democracies and free market, the inequality is increasing very fast. In authoritarian regimes, in dictatorships, inequality is as well increasing. So, I would, I would like to remember a professor of political science that I met several years ago, and unfortunately, deceased, was deceased several years ago as well, is Ulrich Beck. Ulrich Beck made a lot of visions, approaches, very interesting, and one of the concepts he left to us was the concept of the world as a community of risk. The pandemic we are suffering is putting the ideas of Ulrich Beck uh, uh, very clear and very necessary uh, in this moment. So, let me finish uh, invoking a little bit the effort that above all the students, but as well the faculty, has made to adapt to the circumstances of the COVID and the regulations to protect ourselves from the pandemic. Uh, has been a, an effort, we have advanced a lot and get used to digitalization for teaching and for uh, following lectures, but let me hope that this year for the new generation or the, the, the new uh, students of the Bay this year, the face-to-face -face will be the normal form of having classes. Uh, I really hope so because I'm completely convinced that the physical contact, the personal contact is very interesting. Above all, if we consider our task helping to build up your programs of personal formation. And well, last but not least, uh, congratulations for your achievements. Thank you very much for your passions in the course 19 and 20. Thank you very much. And in the name of the Institute, I wish all of you very, very good luck in your personal careers. Thank you very much.
we finish here uh, the ceremony, but we have now a reception with uh, some drinks for all here in the country yard uh, on the right, I think, and well, it's all of you are invited for having this. <laughs>